Well, with just three days notice, I came out here to New Zealand to see a rocket factory. And uh, they got me when they said that there's someone I could talk to that would answer all my questions about rockets. Wonder who that would be. Tim. Well, it's Peter Beck. How's hey, it going? Good to see you. Good to see you. This is the CEO and founder of Rocket Lab. Uh, rumor has it, I can ask you any question. Anything you want, come on down. Let's do it. I have a video tour of the factory already posted. There's a link in the description if you want to see more, which you definitely should. But meanwhile, let's get right into this interview in the coolest boardroom ever. But I do need to apologize about the sound. There is a lot of manufacturing noise and echo in this new room, but it's hard to beat this view. Yep. And that entryway, by the way. What do you think? Oh, um, like literally I was stunned. Good. There was I, I was, I actually just was taken back for a second. Good, that's what I wanted. So did the, did the entry portal remind you of 2001 The Space Odyssey? It, it honestly didn't until she said that. Yeah, right, like, right. Oh yeah, like absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just the stark white with the red accent through it just is, it's amazing. Yep. Yeah, and then going, turning the corner, when clients walk in yep. and see, like it's, it's a, that, even the room of Mission Control is like a work of art. And yeah. the way you're hanging the bottom part of yep. what, a stage right there. Yep. Like that's going to be an experience for, for anyone that gets the opportunity to, to witness a launch there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, so there used to be a quote on the wall, but I had to take it down. And the quote was, um, make everything you do a work of art. Because if it looks like crap and doesn't work, you've got nothing. But if it looks good and, and still doesn't work, at least it looks good. So, I saw that in Long Beach. Uh, in Long Beach, Beach, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, it's, a big, it's a really important thing for me personally, but, you know, throughout the company, as you walk around here, and everything is beautiful. The engineering is beautiful, yeah. the design is beautiful, and it drives people crazy, but um, it's important that, that everything is beautiful. Even yeah. the lawns on the launch site are beautiful. Yeah, you're right. I, I didn't even really think about that, but that's, that's the kind of, but that is the attention to detail that matters. Yeah. Yeah, it and is. It's, it's all that stuff all comes across to a client as knowing that this is how tight you run the ship and how important all of that is to the product even. Yeah, yeah, and, and look, you know, we're, we're kind of, we like to think we're, you know, we're almost the, the ULA version of startup in the fact that, um, you know, we don't, we, don't, we don't rush and take risks. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we, we're getting a bit of a reputation as this, the company that scrubs all the time. And I'm fine with that because, you know, I'll, I'll scrub every day over, you know, making sure something isn't absolutely perfect. Yeah. Um, and I think, I, think it, I think it shows in our, in our results, you know. Um, yeah. You know, when when uh, we went to you know, orbit earlier this year, we just didn't go to orbit. Like that thing, we put it within one kilometer of perigee and three kilometers of apogee and 0 0.09 degrees in inclination. Oh my word. So we inserted that <laughs> exactly where it should be. Yeah, that's, and that's what matters. Exactly. At the end of the day, that's all that matters. Yep. And scrubs are cheaper than booms. Way cheaper. Way cheaper. Way cheaper, yeah. And now, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys actually, there's something specific to your vehicles mm. being built entirely out of carbon fiber. Yep. You have to worry more about, is it called tribal electrification? Oh, tribal electrification, yep. Tell me about that and tell me how, whatever you can speak about, how you've mitigated some of that. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the, it's, a, it's a phenomenon where, you know, you generate static charge as you fly through the clouds. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, there's, there's ways of, of mitigating it. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, initially we, we decided that, you know, we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't bite off that piece of work because what are the chances that Tribo is really going to affect us? Turns out like 50% of every launch. Um, so, uh, so, you know, we, we've ended up, um, you know, going through the whole process of, of uh, coating the rocket and, and special coatings, you know, the nose cones and whatnot. But the carbon composite actually uh, works for you because it's electrically conductive. We only had to make changes to the vehicle on the components that weren't electrically, con electrically conductive. Really? Yeah. And so it's not like, so an aluminum rocket might be worse in that aspect than a carbon fiber rocket or? No, aluminum's great, it's great conductivity. Oh, okay. um, you know, and when you, when you see them painted, yeah, they're painted with you know, uh, paints and coatings that are, carry electric charges. Okay. Um, of course, as you see with our vehicle, we don't paint it because we don't right. need to paint it. Yeah. Um, and so you know, the exterior of the vehicle is fine, but where you have other things like the, no the, you know, the nose cone, which has you know, ablative material on it to deal with the heat, 
that wasn't conductive, so we had to create coatings to so you had to create an ablative triboelectric yep. resistant, or is it like how compatible? You, like, compatible, yeah. okay. Yeah. Nose cone even, but no tribo. Tribo was gone. <laughs> Never will you hear that call. So is that actually a reason you've had to scrub? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, many times we've had to scrub because of tribo. Yeah. Really? Yep. Absolutely. See, that's the stuff that. But people, you know, the average person might go, why are they scrubbing right now? It looks yep. like a beautiful day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're not going to know that the reason is static electricity, essentially. Yep. yep. And now you've mitigated that. Yeah, and th these are all the things as you, as you grow up um, that you learn um, that operational constraints. And, you know, we, 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 the way that we work here and the way, you know, we tell everybody is we're not looking to launch, you know, two or three rockets. We're not, we're not trying to rush to get to the second launch or rush to get right. to the third launch. We're trying to rush to get to the hundredth launch. Yeah. And that requires a whole different kind of thinking um, yeah. with, with that kind of respect. Because well, your end goal is, isn't so much, yeah, like not even a, a number, but it's really your cadence. Like yeah. that's, that's how you become the best wild world machine you can be, is for you guys to be launching a lot of vehicles. Exactly. So why, so is that, is that kind of how you can, can manage not producing larger vehicles? Because you see it as we can specify to our customers, like, you know, we can literally get people on little rockets instead of having to lump them all together and have this kind of clumsy, you know, clumsy manifest then. Is yeah, I mean, if you look at what's happening within the space industry, the big geo birds are declining. The sales are declining in those. Mm -hmm. And you've got, you've got um, SpaceX and Ariane, ULA, all competing for those big geo birds. Mm -hmm. But if you look what's happening in the LEO market, in the small spacecraft market, it's 200% growth year on year on year. Mm -hmm. And there's something like 2,500 2, spacecraft that need launch within the next few years. So oh. the, real, the real needle mover here in the industry is, is frequency. That is what is going to fundamentally change the way we use space and ultimately, you know, as the quote said, you know, life on Earth. That, that's actually, you know, yeah. the, the, the needle mover here. Yeah. And so, so if I'm a customer, yep. a potential customer, I've got a 200 kilogram small set. Yep. Why sell me on, because it might not be by the numbers, it might not be the cheapest cost per, yep. per kilogram, no. you know, dollar per kilogram. Yep. So what, what reason do I come to Rocket Lab then? Well, you're going to get a, a beautiful 3G RMS ride, so you're going to get the softest ride in the industry. And, but more importantly, you get to go on the day you want to go and to the orbit you want to go. Because if you're a couple of hundred kilogram spacecraft, your options to get to orbit right now is ride share. Mm -hmm. That's it. And so you might be waiting a really long time to have to yeah. launch with someone else so, that's even remotely close to your incl inclination in orbit. Exactly, and then, then, then you know, you, you no longer have control over your schedule at all, you, you're, you're, you're piggybacked on somebody else's schedule. And you have no control over the destination of the orbit. Right. No control over the apogee, the perigee, or the inclination. So then you have to provide your own propulsion, which makes your vehicle, like, if you're a small set, you can take them to the destination as opposed to them having to make it bigger and more expensive. So there might be cost savings so they can basically design the, the satellite cheaper, well, I mean, potentially. Well, yeah, and we, we have the same price as rideshare. So you can, you, you can choose to either rideshare and wait years and get to some rubbish orbit, or you can pay the same amount, get a first class service, uh, delivered exactly where you want, on your schedule, on your time frame, um, and uh, with a very, very smooth ride. <laughs> And a cool looking rocket. And, really and you, cool. you own the rocket, you know. Yeah. It's got your logo on it, nobody else's logo. Really? Your customers will be able to put... Of course. Uh, I think I have a new goal that I'm going to save up for life. Forget <laughs> like supercars and stuff. My new goal is to have my own rocket. But it'd be a shame to not fly it then, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. So the, the big the, the next big question is obviously you know carbon fiber and yep and cryogenics how on earth did you tackle that yeah that's a big problem that's a big problem yeah and it's not it's not just the cryogenics because you, you have you know we have our tanks then the you know the lineless tanks um, and you have the liquid oxygen so you have the compatibility of the liquid oxygen with the composite which was a huge amount of research mm -hmm. then all of the the cryogenic element that you point out which is also another you know chunk of research. But you also have exterior thermal heating as well. So you have you know, two, two or 300 degrees exterior temperature heating. Right, right. You've got negative 180 degrees, this is all centigrade, yeah, sorry yeah. by the way. <laughs> negative 183 internal you know, 
uh, cooling mm -hmm. and these great temperature gradients and then you go and smash it through the atmosphere and give it big wax as you pass through shear layers and all those kinds of things and you know you can go down to that tank and literally push on it you know it's that thin so um, it's yeah it was, it was a it was a big engineering challenge to, is that, to get that was that one of the things you almost started with when you're yeah. designing the electron yeah well i mean the, the reason for the carbon composite um, is, is it enables us to to build tanks at an unprecedented performance mass wise mm -hmm. and and um, manufacturing wise it, it's it's unprecedented as well so you know we start off with a tube we bond in bulkheads and we have a tank if you think about how you'd make that tank out of aluminum, you start off with flat sheets of aluminum, you roll them, you friction stir weld them, then you've got to paint them and pascovate them, and then stress relieve them and all those kinds of things. It's, it's a big process. Whereas, you know, you can see out in the factory, we just start off with these, you know, solid lengths of tube and just start, start building tanks. It's, it seems backwards because it seems, you know, carbon fiber is such an exotic material. You know? Yes, it is. And you think of it as like, That'd be so hard to manufacture, but then as long as you have a machine that can the processes, yeah, yeah. produce it, yeah. You're, that's half the challenge. And so I put together a little, a little interesting kind of maybe coincidence about you know New Zealand, yep, and carbon fiber and the history of New Zealand. Yep, you guys are really big into sailboat racing. Yep, and exactly. with really high-end carbon fiber hulls and carbon exactly. fiber sails and masts and all that stuff. Yep. So have you actually poached from the sailing industry then? To well, absolutely. And in, in, you know, before I started Rocket Lab, I was working in a government lab on advanced um, composite materials and structures. So you know, um, we, we we all came into this to this loving the black. You know, the, the yeah. black's good. Um, so yeah, New Zealand does have a, a very rich history and, and a strong uh, kind of you know capability in, in composites for sure. So yeah, no, we um, we, we certainly. Um, I think we employ one third of all of the composite industry within uh, New Zealand. Really? Yeah. I mean, that's one of those things you would just never, ever know. I mean, that's really cool that a, a, an island nation this small, what, four million people or something? Yep. yep. That you guys are able <laughs> to be experts in carbon fiber, which is clearly one of those industries that's continuing to replace a lot of traditional you know, aluminum and steel in a lot of instances. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really cool. And another thing that you guys do, obviously, so obviously I think the other, really, one of the biggest things that's so unique with you guys is obviously your electric turbo pumps. Yep. I mean, everyone talks about that. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. An, yeah. For an obvious reason, no one else has done it. Yep. First off, why had no one else done it yet? It's one of those fundamentally really awesome ideas. Yeah, I think I think there's the, the answer to that is a couple of fold. So, so firstly, you know, the battery technology just really wasn't there until recently. Yeah. Um, also, the power electronics. You know, you know, our speed controllers and motor controllers are the size of a you know your hand, and they're dealing with with you know 60 kilowatts of power per controller. So huge, huge energies out of these tiny little components. Mm -hmm. So, so I think you know that 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 technology has advanced a lot. Um, so I think it was always possible. Um, but the, the, the funny thing is that um, when, you, when you look at the cycle, you know, and we, we watched it with amusement, right? When we first announced the turbo pump cycle, um, you know, we, we watched everybody, you know, all the forums light up and say, oh, that'll never work, it's impossible, you know, the density of the mass of the batteries, they'll never get there. And, you know, if you look at the, the, you know, the chemical equilibrium for a gas generator versus carrying all those batteries all the way, it's never going to work and rah, rah, rah. We just sat there going, Because <laughs> you knew. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You actually knew. Well, we, of course we did. But, I mean, I think one of the things that people didn't realise about that is nothing closes until you eject a battery. And um, when we when we flew, sorry, the, say that again. Nothing closes until you eject a battery. Explain that. So the second stage, you'll see when the second stage flies about you know, two, the, two thirds through the burn. These two silver, silver things come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are the batteries. Yeah, you're hot swapping so, basically. Exactly. So we treat batteries as fuel. So you draw the fuel out of the batteries. You draw the energy out yeah. of the batteries. Once they're, they're they're spent their energy, you eject them. So a gas generator cycle is at best 50% efficient mm -hmm. because you know you're burning com your combustion temperatures are very low and it's mm -hmm. about 50% efficient. Yeah. Electric turbo pump is 98% efficient. So you can, if you eject the batteries, you're in a better place than a gas generator. Because huh. the, 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 the argument has always been, well, you have to take all the mass of the batteries to orbit. No, no you don't. Who said you had to do Who that? Who said you dared to do that? And battery technology, you know, is as we all know, that's one of the most competitive. In, that's the new oil right now. You know, everyone's 100%. fighting 
to make batteries better yep. and more viable, cheaper, better density, better char, all the stuff. Yep. So you guys are riding that and curve. And we, we are reaping the benefit of all of that because you know when we started, um, you know we, where we started when we first started the electric turbo pump program to where we are now, which is just like three or four years, mm -hmm. um, you know it's it's about a thirty percent improvement already. So you know, and there's a there's a lot of things on the horizon that are like a two x or a three x. So, um, so that just works to your advantage. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So will you be doing? Do you think you'll be doing like small design iterate? I mean, are you planning to kind of evolve the vehicles when these technologies come out, or do you think you'll end up at some point being like, all right, we've got a new battery technology that we can use. We can now stretch. Like, is it easy for you guys to stretch the tanks? Of course. Yeah. And now that you save some mass in the batteries, you can stretch the tank a little bit. Yep, we could do that, but um, for us, it's, it, it's more about increasing reliability than yeah. increasing performance. Um, yeah. You know, this is the question, I'm surprised you haven't asked it already, because this is the question I get asked every time. So oh, I think I was going to put a sign here that says, don't ask when a bigger rocket's coming. Yes, exactly, thank you. <laughs> um, because, you know, the, 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 you know, the upgrades we'll do to the vehicle are, are, are not to lift more. It's, it's to, to lift more often. And more reliably, um, and I think this is the thing that's always m been missed in the space industry: is it is no standard. I mean, you take the CubeSat as a standard, right? A three U CubeSat is a standard, mm -hmm. except for the pregnant, the non-pregnant, the tuna can, without tuna can, the extra large, and all the machinations of the three U, which mm -hmm. make it non-standard. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to provide a platform that is absolutely standard. The environments are standard so that, that people can, can build spacecraft and just get them on orbit and provide services. This, this is the, the, you know, the absolute end goal here, mm -hmm. is to just enable companies and people to build infrastructure in space. Get rid of all of the crap that goes along with it and just get to that point. You're almost, it's such a different philosophy. I feel like you didn't start with like, you're not starting with we need to do, I don't know, it's almost like backwards from what I think a lot of... Oh, I think it's frontwards. I think it's yeah. backwards. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, and that might be. It's definitely, it seems like almost 180 degrees different from the normal way that someone will look at building a rocket. It's like we have to lift X, Y, or Z doing this, that, and that, and they have these variables. And you started on such a blank page that you could yeah. literally define your own variables. And I think some of those obviously is launch cadence and reliability. Yep. Yep. What other variables were you able to start with when you decided to design the Well, I mean, truck? naturally we chose a payload class that, that physics um, you know, marries well with. At 150 kilograms, a couple of hundred kilograms, you can build a seriously meaningful spacecraft mm -hmm. to provide meaningful services. Mm -hmm. You know, 60 kilograms, 50 kilograms, 20 kilograms, lifting CubeSats, you know, don't get me wrong, CubeSats are wonderful, mm -hmm. but if you want to build a really serious spacecraft, then mm -hmm. you, you quickly find yourself in that 150 kilogram place. Okay. And if you look at all the mega constellations, mm -hmm. they're all around that 150, 200 kilogram place. What are the most serious contenders for like mega constellations right now? I know there's, is OneWeb yep. still kind of, I yeah, haven't heard from them lately, but um, then SpaceX is talking about Starlink. Yep. What, are, there, are there other people out there, <laughs> excuse me, talking about doing... Yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely there are. And yeah. most of those are around that 200... Of course, they're all, all, all that are under, yeah. Huh. yeah. So you've defined your... Well, it's obvious. Like, it's, 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 very, it's very, you know, the, the, it, it converges. It's like a bicycle frame, you know, the triangle design, just the bit, it converges, right? If you, if you think about what are the things that I need up there, I need a certain amount of comms power, a certain amount of electricity, you know, harvesting, um, you know, a, a certain amount of station keeping. You put combine all those things and you miniaturize them at today's technology, and mm -hmm. you end up with around about that. Huh. And um, you know, it's very rare that we'll find a spacecraft that's too too big for us, too heavy for us, too wide for us um, in 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 this in this you know this market space. Like really? it all it all converges. Dang. Uh, so I guess I, I I mentioned the manufacturer SpaceX. I have to mm -hmm. ask as a as a space fan. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. As as obviously someone that is watching this stuff as close as anyone. How does it feel? I feel like you guys are compared to SpaceX all the time. It's kind of the new young SpaceX. Is that a big compliment to you? Do you love that? Are you kind of like do you cringe when that happens? Well, what's that like? Well, I mean, I think I think SpaceX has absolutely redefined the industry. Um, so, you know, to be held in the same light, of, of course, is always, is always favourable. But I like to think that we're Rocket Lab, we're not the yeah. next SpaceX, we're the new Rocket Lab. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we're, we're our own thing and, and you know, the, the big difference is, I guess, we're not 
you know, I'm not a billionaire. I'd like to be a billionaire, <laughs> but you know, it's, um, it's not a, you know, we're, we're the only non, the only non-billionaire space company right now that's that's kind of you know got stuff done. Yeah. Um, and um, and you know, it's 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 it, human space flight is wonderful, and I think it's hugely inspiring for the human race. Um, it's just not something I'm into um, personally. I think. We you, can. You don't fly meat. I don't it? fly meat. That's right. <laughs> I, I think we can move the needle for everybody on this planet more by building infrastructure and space to provide real stuff, really things that are really important to everybody. I mean, if we send a few people into, uh, you know, to Mars, don't get me wrong, absolutely wonderful. I'll be cheering. I'll be at the front of the cheerleader. I think that's hugely inspiring. Yeah. But if we can build a constellation of a couple of hundred spacecraft or whatever. If we can provide internet to everybody on the planet and distill the knowledge of everybody, you know, of everything to everybody on the planet, that moves the needle for the species further, in my opinion. So that's what I'm focusing my efforts on. That's really noble because I feel like that question comes up all the time of just why space. You yep. know, people will be like, why do we spend all that money up there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it's hard to explain to people that well, that money, a first, that money stays down here. Obviously, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. generating revenue on Earth. But people often don't tangibly understand the benefits it's, of spaceflight to them. You it's, know, it's hidden infrastructure. Yeah. it's like pipes under the road. Right. Like you know, until it, it goes bad. Like until you flush Michigan. your toilet and it all comes backwards, yeah. you don't care about those pipes. Yeah, exactly. It's the same. It's the same with GPS. You know, space with GPS. You turn mm. off GPS and see what happens in the world. Oh God. You know, no more Tinder. It's out. Gone. Yeah. No more Uber. Yeah. <laughs> You're, and as soon as you know, self-driving cars are going, if yep. that happens and people forget how to drive, we're all yeah. just going to be a sack of potatoes, you exactly. know, on the interstate. Like that's and that's it, crazy to think about. Yeah. And, and people, it's a common misperception. People don't realize how reliant they are on space infrastructure. It's critically reliant. Even like banking transactions. Everything. You know? I mean everything. Yeah. yeah. That's it's so that's that is interesting because. I'm a pretty big proponent of, of exploration. I think it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. in our, you know. It's, oh, it's, I agree. Don't get me wrong. I don't, don't disagree. I absolutely agree. But I've never heard someone not have that role. I, not you. You obviously still do have the romantic vision of it, but the fact that you're not pursuing that is. No. It's that's. I've just never really thought of that, and that's really interesting. Mm. That's that's unique. That is unique to you, I think. But I love that. So that that brings me up to. Um, as far as the electron goes, how many you guys are licensed to be able to fly it every seventy-two hours? Out of, out of the Mahi launch site, yeah. Yeah. And don't forget, we're going to get another U.S. launch site coming online soon, so that'll increase that a little bit more. Yeah. And then, you know, it's a very good reason why LC One is called LC One. There's intentions to have many more than one. So. Yeah, yeah. As far as launch sites go and launch cadences go, mm -hmm. uh, you were very particular when you chose New Zealand. Yep. And it's not because you're from New Zealand that you, that you landed there. Mm -hmm. uh, so first, describe some of the benefits that you guys have launching here and why you chose this for your first launch site. Yep. And then let's talk about that new well, site. Well, do the hardest one first. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. So, I mean, look, we're all about launch frequency. And, you know, we, we spoke to all the ranges in the US and it's one thing that doesn't scale very well in the US. Is, is launch frequency and it's not for any other reason other than just air traffic and shipping a marine. So when the Falcon Heavy went, I saw there was a report, it was like 560 flights were delayed or cancelled when Falcon Heavy flew. Now, Are you serious? No, it's true, yeah. Or so, diverted or just yep, had some kind of... Delayed or cancelled, yep. Oh my gosh. Because, and, and you know, when I turn up to a launch site and say, hey, I'm Peter Beck, I want to launch every 24 hours, everyone goes, Good, but you can call up all the air, you know, the airlines and tell them that you're going to mess with their, their schedules. So it was very obvious that it was hard to scale the kind of launch frequency that we wanted to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, so we looked all around the world for a launch site, and what you need is a small island nation you know, in the middle of nowhere, and that's ideally New Zealand. It took a lot of work, it took a tremendous amount of work, bilateral treaties and new legislations oh. and laws and stuff. Um, did, do you feel like you just swapped one set of paperwork out of approvals with like the FAA and all the air traffic stuff? Oh no, we still we fly under an FAA launch license, so we had to do that too. So you you really did just cut back on a lot of the the having to work around flight schedules. Yes. And marine traffic. So you have to understand, we 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 st I started with like one piece of paper, and on that piece of paper it had two requirements: must be affordable, must launch weekly. And everything has been driven from those two requirements. Building a launch site and whatnot. 
And the easy thing to do would be, okay, let's just build a launch site in the US and let's just live with one a month and then we'll worry about how we can get to true frequency. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not going to work for us. We, we, we need vision and, and, and you know, a roadmap to get to this. So we decided to do the hardest thing first, mm -hmm. um, which was build our own launch site. And you literally built every square inch of that and your own tracking infrastructure, right? Yep. Yes, we have tracking stations all around the world. Um, and, and, yeah, and when we built everything, we, we had to build roads. We had to push in brand new roads. We had to upgrade roads. We had to upgrade internet backhauls to entire townships. You <laughs> name it. Um, you know, it was a big infrastructure project. How did the locals feel about that? Yeah, I mean, we work really, really closely with the locals. Um, you know, the, 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 the land that, that, um, that the launch site's own is, is, um, is on, is owned by uh, local iwi, indigenous Maori people. Mm -hmm. um, they were looking at uh, diversifying their farming, so space just was a great diversification. Oh. <laughs> I feel like not too many people ever get to choose between like a, a crop or a sheep and a rocket. Yeah, it's a funny story, because we met in a donut shop in, uh, in, in, um, in Napier. And uh, we met there and we explained, um, you know, what we were looking to do and, and what it was about. And, and, uh, and George and Ben looked at, other, at each other and said, well, we've been looking at getting out of farming. So um, diversifying farming, I should say. So that was, um, it was a funny conversation. And they were, obviously, that made them, like, they, I just can't, I, I would love to see their reactions when you initially tell them we're going to launch rockets from there. I mean, yeah, I mean, look, uh, it, I, I kind of simplified it because we did a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we spent a lot of time in the community. We had lots of cups of teas uh, in the community, and we made ourselves very available yeah. um, because it can be a scary thing, right? Yeah. Um, you know, this company's going to turn up and launch rockets. Right. What the hell? Yeah. So, um, so we, we spent a lot of time with community engagement and built a lot of relationships down there. And, you know, we're very lucky that we have such a supportive community. Yeah, that's, that is, that's important. That's important. It's critical. So. It's critical. Yeah. So now you have a new community yes. that, you're, <laughs> yep. that you guys are, are, have just announced, and that is that you are going to be launching from Wallops. Correct. And that's in West Virginia, right? Or, Correct. Yeah. yeah. And uh, now, how did you end up there? You had four sites you were looking at, right? Yep. So you had Alaska, yep. Vandenberg, yep. Uh, Kennedy Space Center, yep. and Wallops. So why Wallops? Tell me, give well, me I mean, that decision process. To be, to be fair, it was a very close call and a really tough decision. Um, you know, and bear in mind, this is the first site, so uh, it doesn't mean it's the only. Mm -hmm. um, but what we needed uh, immediately was a site that we could achieve um, a very fast build on because we have customers that need to fly. Um, and, and a site that you know we could leverage a lot of infrastructure, and a site that wasn't too busy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's it's wonderful walking around KSC. It's 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 a dream, right? Yeah, it's yeah, a dream. Of course, yeah. Um, but um, you know, for this particular series of missions that we need to and we need to you know, do, we, we just couldn't get there fast enough. And um, and that site's very busy right now, um, and Wallops is not. Yeah. So this, it obviously services the, the orbit you need from there. So is, yep. there, is there like a specific customer you're looking for mostly for this? Like a specific one that you need? Oh, we have a number of customers that, that, um, you know, that, that are ready to use that site. So um, fly mm -hmm. out of that site. How does it actually make sense, instead of them shipping you a satellite down here, yep. how does it make sense for you to ship the whole rocket up there? How do, well, we have a factory in Huntington Beach. So um, you know, we'll ship, we'll ship the, the components that we need um, that are built here up yeah. to Huntington Beach for, for integration. Final integration. You have to remember that we already have stuff, a whole lot of stuff coming from Huntington Beach, all the engines and the avionics and the electronics. It's all coming from there. So it's just kind of, so it's like you give us around. stuff and we'll give you stuff and we're good. And but someday do you see producing engines down here maybe and no. doing full integration here? No, we always produce the engines in, in Huntington Beach. Okay. We have, we have what, what about building the fuselages up in Huntington? Is that yeah, I mean if there's enough if there's enough um, if there's enough, you know, flight rate that requires it we will. If, I mean again if the numbers close yeah, at some yeah. point if it's cheaper to do it there, do exactly. it there. Yeah. Yeah. Nice and easy. I mean, you can just let the numbers speak for themselves, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's certain strategic reasons why we keep certain things, you know, like composites here, you, you alluded before, is we have an incredibly strong industry here mm -hmm. and, and a very very high talent pool. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's certain industries um, in America that are, are, you know, for talent is very, very you know, tightly contested. So, you know, you, you may go up there to try and do some of this work, but actually you can't employ the people that you need to employ and scale the way you need to scale. Yeah. So cert certain things make certain sense. And I guess that's the, that, that, that's really the, you know, the, the rocket lab way. Uh, 
Um, now, as far as the actual, uh, back to choosing of the launch sites. Though, yep. If you tell me how you actually do, you literally like run computer simulations to figure out like where the flight traffic is. The, or, like, did you look at oh, the course and all that stuff? I mean, the, the nice thing about um, the US is that's that's you know really widely available. Um, yeah. So so yeah, but I mean you know in, in selecting launch locations you know, for the Mahia site, um, there's tremendous amount of analysis that that, that was done. Yeah, oh, I bet. So, but the, the, the Mahia site can, you can service a lot of inclinations from there. Yeah. Like yeah. almost all of them, basically, right? Sun synchronous all the way to 39, yeah. So we just can't get 39 to the equator. Okay. So that, so is that why wallops, can wallops service then what, what Mahia cannot? No, wallops, wallops can service up to 37, so it's not actually a lower inclination. But the advantage with wallops is, um, you know, we have customers that don't want to leave America, so we can shoot their payloads mm. um, from, from America. Okay. And mm. as far as, are those typically American customers, then I assume that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they don't want to, are they, are they against the opposite side of the world or something? Or no, what's no, no, I mean, you know, it, it comes down to the payloads um, and, you know, what, what they want to ship and what they don't want to ship. And, yeah and the sensitivities around some of that, so. Yeah. So, okay, so sensitivities. I had never heard you say, or anyone quote, that you, you pull only a 3G ride the whole way up. Mm. Is that, obviously that's intentional because you, you have that as a selling point, basically. Yeah. Um, 3G RMS. What's RMS? Like, RMS oh, mean squared. Oh, so you're total, your average. Oh, there's a spectrum, right? yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, because you're not peak, you might have a higher, a higher moment peaks. of higher yeah, peaks. Yeah, 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 okay. at certain frequencies, but it's okay. an RMS value. Okay. Yeah. But um, to put I, it into context, I don't want to... Yeah. Know, but put it into context, uh, the NASA Gibbs, which is what you have to fly a CubeSat, qualify a CubeSat to, is 12 G RMS. So, you know, so put it this way, a transportation vibe spectrum is mm -hmm. worse than the flight spectrum. So when we have a customer who has to transport their payload to New Zealand, it sees a harsher environment than the flight to orbit. How many, how many Gs would it see on a commercial flight? Well, I mean, you have to account for you know, dropping the pallets and like, there's, a, there's a, you know, mil A110, you know, standard for it. But it's a duration, like it's, you know, it's a 12, 15 hour duration, mm -hmm. so it's duration scaled. But then, I mean, when we're working with customers um, and they're doing their, their vibration criteria and you know, acceptance criteria, that's, that's the driving factor, it's not the launch vehicle. Really? Yeah. So that can, again, allow them to potentially manufacture... Well, build spacecraft lighter yeah. and have appendages that, are, 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 you know, can deploy more and, and you, don't, you don't put all that effort into building a brick, you right. put all that mass into building a capable spacecraft. So you can actually make more delicate little solar exactly. panels we, and things. We're, we're already seeing, like, people are building to the electron standard. They're taking mm -hmm. the electron standard and saying, okay, I'm going to build my, my spacecraft or my constellation to fly in that thing. Because it just opens the envelope, yeah. you know? Yeah, I, I guess I never thought of that. That's why I'm not down there doing stuff, because <laughs> that's not my job. That is really cool. So another thing you probably do, or I, that I've wanted to always ask about, with, sure. with having nine engines on the bottom, yep. do they all gimbal? Yep. Do you do any thrust differential for yaw and pitch? No, we don't. Yeah. No, it's, it's all done through the TBC. Okay. Yeah, roll control and, and all roll. pitch and roll, it's all through the TBCs. But, I mean, if one company could do thrust differential, it'd probably oh, be your engines. I mean, God, yeah. I mean, I mean we things. have basically infinite variable throttle control. Yeah, which um, no one else. You can change it probably more precisely, like quickly and precisely than anyone. Oh, and we do. On, you know, on ascent, we're continually modifying the throttle profile on ascent to maximize efficiency. Okay, so here's, this is actually one of those questions that I've never oh, found. I know where you're going with this. <laughs> do you? Oh, let's see. I've never had anyone explain it because I, I just can't get the answer. Okay, so SpaceX's Block 5, the Merlin 1Ds, yep. they quoted saying that they're doing something that they acted like was new. Mm. They're maintaining only, I think it's, what, 100 uh, or 180,000 pounds of thrust per engine or whatever it is. Mm. Um, but, and they're lowering the chamber pressure mm. on ascent to keep that, you know, a variable chamber pressure. Mm -hmm. And I can't, for the life of me, figure out a why that's advan ad, you know, advantageous, mm -hmm. and, and advantageous, and b how that's any different than throttling anyway. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, your only forcing function over chamber pressure is propellant flow rates. So, um, you know, you, you're throttling to reduce chamber pressure. Yeah. So it's not. 
Yeah. It's probably not anything. But I mean, you, there's good reason why you want to do that. I mean, you know, at, at certain points of the atmosphere, your, your nozzle is optimized for, right. for you know, that, that, that thrust. That altitude, yeah. Yeah, it's altitude, yeah. exactly. So, you know, there's good reason to try and altitude compensate with the throttle on, on the send. So how, how is that altitude compensating? Is it because you're lowering the chamber pressure? So I guess the difference between being in space and being on the ground is, is one bar. Yes. So if you lower your chamber pressure by one bar, you've kind of canceled the difference No, there? it's not, not that easy, no. no. But I mean, uh, you know, your, your exit area is optimized and it's always a trade, right? So when you're on the ground, you're, you, you know, you're overexpanded. Over yeah. And then when, when you're at, at Miko, you're, you're underexpanded. Yeah. So you try and pick that, pick that sweet spot. Now you can play tricks you know, if, you, if you start modifying your throttle, but you've got to trade that off against gravity drag. Right. Because if you throttle it back down, then you're then you're eating eating gravity drags. Yeah. So you don't want to you don't want to do that or aero drags. Mm -hmm. And then you also got to tailor in aero heating, right? So as you're saying, you, you don't want to cook either. Yeah. So yeah. the easy you know the best thing to do is get it all out quick. But the trouble with getting it all out quick is it gets hot. Yeah. So and it pulls G's. It pulls G's, of course. Yeah. So you all you you always you know this is the life of of, of rocket guys, right? You always it's always a compromise yeah. of engineering. Yeah, I, I, that's, that was always my philosophy with photography. It's always a compromise. Always a compromise. I mean, there, you can lower your shutter speed, but then now you're going to get blur, you know, yeah, yeah. raise your ISO, and now it's going to get grainy. Yeah. Or spend a lot of money even, yeah. you know, versus for, you know, for X difference. Yeah. And I can't imagine the charts and the people making those decisions on, it's because there are so many variables. There's so many variables. And they all it's, have to snake around each other, and yep. at some point you have to just go, this is our choice. Yep. Is and that, and some, some days it's, it's, it's whack-a-mole, right? So you, you, you whack one and whoop, it, it, it is an un, unintended yeah. consequence and, you know, it's, yeah. It's, is that something, even though you've now flown and are literally ramping up to fly <laughs> dozens more of these, mm. is that something you do as rocket engineers, as a company, continually refine a little bit? Like, of oh, course. Could probably... Yeah, I mean, and for us, the refinement here is, is, is manufacturability. Like, how can we increase manufacturing cadence? Um, and and there always will be a continued drive on on reliability. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you, I think if you stop optimizing for those things, then you know, it's it's a bad day. Yeah, and you're growing complacent. Yeah. Yep. So your big difference is that you're able to crank these things out like crazy. They're reliable, and you can how quickly if I were to tell you I have a satellite. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe not right now as you're getting ready to return to flight, but mm -hmm. in the future, I mean, literally, what is realistic as far as I need, to, I need this to go to space? How long so I take? think I think our record um, is, a, is um, a payload, uh, it's probably a couple of months. Yeah? Um, from first contact to it's on board. Um, but the limiting factor there is, is regulatory. It's, it's, it's not our simulation, our coupled loads analysis, it's not that. Um, you know, it's, it's not modifying payload plates. And, and all that kind of physical stuff. Mm -hmm. It's licensing. Really? Yep. So you know, does the spacecraft have all the all the correct you know um, uh, frequency allocation lights licenses, NOAA licenses, mm -hmm. um, FAA licenses, New Zealand Space Agency licenses? That's th those are the limiting factors. Okay. So and there's always going to be some kind of just a limitation there. Yeah, but I mean, to, to be fair, um, you know, all the agencies understand this and mm -hmm. are actively working. To find solutions to it, yeah. and you know that's it's 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 the one thing that I, I'll say is is you know we've we're unique in some respects, and we've enjoyed working with the regulators. We haven't found the regulators at all trying to put roadblocks huh. in what we're trying to achieve. We've mm -hmm. found the regulators trying to solve problems with us. Mm -hmm. um, the FAA, especially, uh, we were the first ever truly 100% FAA licensed launch because all of the other launches launch out of Wallops or Vandenberg or Alaska and they're all they're all federal federal ranges. Right. So this is the real first true hundred percent commercial launch was done huh. done out of Mahia. So it was the first time the FAA really had to do that in, in the full commercial sense in a different country. Right. So you know it's 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 very easy to to say no and make it complicated, but they didn't. You know, they right. said yeah, this is good. Let's work out how we can do this. Uh, the other thing that I as a rocket nerd I should almost do a segment called, but it works in Kerbal Space Program, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and talk about some of those things. But I think one of the big ones that I would love to hear someone that knows why, explain it. Why, why not aerospikes? Why haven't aerospikes mm. been flown 
did you, have you ever did you look at them? Mm. Is it something you would love to do at some point, or what? Give, tell me the actual oh the curse builders. the curse of the Aerospark. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's where hard. are where is I've, our Aerospark? I've got an engine out there. It's an Aerospark. Um, I mean, I've I've done my time on Aerospikes myself. Really? Yeah. I mean, so they're they're I guess they're they're attractive um, for all of the right physics reasons, mm -hmm. but a pain in the ass for all of the engineering reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it kind of cancels itself out. I mean, if physics says it's better, um, but engineering, you're trying to engineer them, um, it's, 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 it's far more complicated. And the mass and complexity you end up driving into them, and this is my impressive experience, mm -hmm. driving into them versus just you know, a typical conical bell, um, it's just not worth it. So you physically are adding mass to potentially gain a little bit of specific you, you know, end up in the same point. You, in, in my experience, you end up exactly in the same point, except with a much more complicated system that's unproven. And I think cooling has always been a big issue because yeah. you're just, you, it's really hard to do that in the middle of, a, <laughs> in yeah, the yeah, middle yeah. of it. And then, then, it's, and then it's other things like TVC, you know, it's, it's very easy to gimbal a chamber, piece of cake. But, you know, a whole aerospike, you know, do you, you know, gimbal the whole aerospike or do you, do you have a multiple port aerospike where you just throttle the aerospike? And, right. And, and then, you know, what about all the altitude compensation effects and, and that, that you get? Um, I mean, you have the same, same kind of complexities with multiple engines, you know, the plume-plume interactions, you know, as you're ascending through atmosphere, you've got all those plume-plume interactions and the, the plumes are changing. And then, you know, your control system's changing as well because, you know, the, the, the TVC, can, you know, works, it, it, you know, functions differently at, at, at different plume-plume interactions and recirculation zones, and it's all pain in the ass. Um, but it's still less of a pain in the ass than, than something like an aerospike, in, in, in my opinion. Yeah, but see that's, that's the thing that I think people just, it's the internet, so of course you're going to have yeah. armchair engineers like me that yeah. are just sitting there going, but, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. The, 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 you know, there's obviously some logic behind it. It's not yeah. like, it's not like this a golden, you know, child waiting there to be adopted, it's just that yeah. it clearly has, again, a big compromise. Yeah, and the other thing to think about is that um, you know, if we were a lab, maybe that's a, a pure you know, research lab, it's mm -hmm. a different story. We're a commercial company. Right. Um, we need, you know, R&D is, is, is no, no fun right. anymore. R&D is just expensive <laughs> and time consuming. Yeah. Um, so, you know, <laughs> pick, pick your battles. Yeah. And um, in the industry right now, what we see um, is just a whole ton of, especially in small launch, a whole ton of companies trying to differentiate themselves with different technologies. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it, it's almost like you have to come to something new in order to be funded or in order to be, you know, the Taking guy. Seriously or yeah, like PR. Exa ex exactly, I mean, we, we did a lot of stuff new, not at all because we wanted to differentiate ourselves. Differentiate ourselves. Um, we didn't build carbon tanks and 3D printed engines and literature, but all those kind of things to, to try and be different because you know everything else is, is no good. Those were the, going back to that white sheet of paper, those were the things that were going to enable this frequency. We needed mm. to 3D print rocket engines. There's no way that we could electroform rocket engines at a cost and a, you know, a performance and a, and a frequency that we needed. We needed mm. to 3D print. That was the only technology that scales. Mm. All the other technology didn't scale. So it is a matter of it's kind of the right place at the right time for you because if you had probably tried to do this 15, 20 years ago mm -hmm. before 3D printing was commercially available at the scale yep. it is and, and battery technology, I mean, you would have not been here today. It would have been a very different vehicle, yeah, yeah. and a different proposition, yeah, yeah. for sure. And now you're able to, with compared to other aerospace companies, mm. start up and have a successful launching program already with a lot fewer moving parts and yep. lower lower financial investments as well. You haven't had to have ten billion dollars from you know the air force or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's right. I that's mean right. that's amazing. That yeah. that should definitely be celebrated. And I hope that that helps encourage other people that are, you know, on that fence of whether or not they're gonna take the dive into some scary venture, you know? I mean Yeah, and and you know, they should. because um, what's the worst that can happen, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So why I guess what was that point for you? When did you just know I have to do this and I'm going to, you had to have at some point put all eggs in the basket and say, mm. Rocket Lab, like this is my destiny, I, I can't do anything else. What was that tipping point or what was the decision? Yeah, so I mean for me it's always been about space. So every, I've always worked multiple shifts in my life. The first shift, you know, the day shift was a paying job 
and it was a paying job that was, you know, both financially but also technically driving towards the goal of mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. um, so e everything that I did was to try and drive towards the goal of a rocket lab. I would do, you know, back at the government lab, I'd work during the day on advanced composites and structures, and then come, come five o'clock, I'd click over into the second shift and I'd be doing the same thing with rockets and using the government's, you know, the crown asset that was sitting there dormant at night to build rockets. So, mm -hmm. so it's always been about this for me. So there's, there's kind of, there's a couple of inflection points, but there's no like one tipping point where um, I'm just going to wake up and, and right. it's in, you know, it's, 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 it's a lifelong passion and journey. It's not a, it's not an instantaneous, Hey, might build rockets today. Right. It's, it's, it's just, yeah. So you and Burt Monroe then just oh, lifelong. Don't talk. No, Burt Monroe. What is that bad? It's to, bad for me. Why? He wanted to do. Have you seen his, his motorbike? He did a wonderful thing. Have you seen his motorbike? It's held together with wire and cable ties. But he knew from the get-go, like his whole life almost, was just so leading we, on this journey to do his, you know, pursue his passion. So, so the Bex and the Moreau, the, the, the Monroes. You should know that the Monroes used to come and use my grandfather's workshop. Bert used to come into my grandfather's workshop and use all his lathes and mills to make his, his motorbike. No way. And it used to drive my grandfather absolutely insane because <laughs> he'd come in, make a hell of a mess, and then bugger off. So you have a personal connection with Bert Monroe too then? Well, I think, I mean, it's New Zealand, right? It's just That's two true. degrees of freedom. <laughs> That, to me, that's just hilarious, and the fact that it's almost, I mean, in my opinion, that'd be like the coolest thing ever. I think that guy is amazing. But oh, look, don't get me wrong, he, he, he achieved wonderful things. Yeah, but um, he's the way more, I'm going to just make this out of the wire in my fence instead yeah. of the art you're creating. Bert, Bert wasn't so worried about aesthetics. <laughs> no, he wasn't. But his attitude, though, of, yeah, yeah, of yeah. just clearly... The, the goal was out here and, and against all odds, you know, I yep. mean, eventually got there, you know, and I yeah. think that's a... Well, I mean, I've always said you need two things, you know, you need a dream and just work. Yeah. That's it. Mm -hmm. You don't need anything else. Yeah. For anything can be accomplished with those two things. Yeah. And it's so funny because I think a lot of people ask um, people that, you know, are clearly doing outrageous things. I get asked, you know, how are you able to be a full-time <laughs> fake astronaut, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and. It's a matter of, there's a lot of work that people it don't is. see. A dream and, and hard work, that's it. Yeah. It's just it. And if at some point you can't not do it. You know, mm -hmm. like you're so mm -hmm. driven by the passion and by, the, you, you can see what's ahead. You, you know, yep. you just know if I do this and this, it'll lead to this and this and this and it just com keeps compounding. Yep. And so I wonder if that's just a common thing amongst like entrepreneurs and creators. It is. Is they just can't help it. It is. It is. I'm destined for that. It, I think it is. Yeah. I mean, I think you, most entrepreneurs have a capacity to absorb work that is unnatural. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think that's absolutely right. Um, now going back a step, as long as you'll have me, because I'll talk rockets with you as long as you'll have me. Oh no, I'm, I'm happy. This is fun. Um, so. Is there any advantage when you have nine engines mm. to doing any kind of throttling to perform almost like an aero spike, you know, it, on ascent that the center engine can stay at a higher mm. thrust than the outside or anything like that? And is there any cool fluid dynamics that happen that you can? Uh, I mean, th there is, and um, you know, we, we have done some stuff there. Um, it's it's an incredibly complex problem. If you want to talk about trying to solve analysis, you've got You've got you know chemical, you've got multi-physics, um, structural, thermal, you name it. Like it's it's like the hell analysis. Um, mm -hmm. You know the whole CFD element is is coupled in there, and and as as you are seeing, like it's a continually changing variable. Mm -hmm. um, like your domain that you're working in is continually changing, so it's not like you can just optimize for one point in time. Right. Right. Um, and for us, we spend a lot of time on this, a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yet, the bottom line is, yeah, there are some tricks you can do yeah. um, to, to, uh, to play with stuff. Even, we know if all your engines are able to thrust vector control, is it advantageous to actually aim them into the center at near Miko or anything, you know, as they get closer to the vacuum space, or does that not really... Oh, there's the stuff you can do. <laughs> I may have just figured some stuff out. So, on that note, what have there been any fun challenges or any fun developments that you know that you let on that you can talk about or want to talk mm. about? 
um, that you maybe didn't see from the get-go, you know, like anything, well, I think for me, like the tribal electrification thing, I had no idea that was yeah. any consideration. Were there any other, you know, with like, with New Zealand and the nature and birds or something or any of those like weird, we had to do this because oh, of that? Or man, I don't know where to start. I mean, <laughs> uh, I had to sing on a marae. Um, that, was, that wasn't in my job description. Um, <laughs> but um, I, for, uh, I don't really know what that is. Uh, in New Zealand, when you are welcomed onto an indigenous land, you what's called a kōwhiri, um, with uh, Māori people. And uh, as part of that, you have to sing. Um, and so our whole company at the time, quite small, went uh, to Mahia and we all sung. And they joined in, it was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> is this on, do you have video of this somewhere? I hope not. Not that it's never seen Yeah, <laughs> certainly not that you can have. <laughs> well, I hope you know that, you know, at some point one of the most famous images, for better or worse, of early SpaceX is Elon with maracas. I hope that someday, in <laughs> 10 years, we yeah. can uncover <laughs> all of the team of Rocket Lab singing indigenous songs yep. in order to gain access to the land. Is that basically what it was? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's about, you know, being, you know, a, a good cultural steward and, mm -hmm. and you know being welcome into that community mm -hmm. I mean it's actually it's actually a very moving experience yeah. um, but um, for a person who's managed to go through their entire life you know lip syncing to even like the school assembly having to stand up there basically cold stone solo and uh, having to do it is um, <laughs> you probably didn't see that I, I can talk to a, th a room of thousands of people and not be worried but that was terrifying <laughs> If, I, if you had to guess before opening that launch site that you were going to have to sing in front of a group of people, do you think that would have changed your opinion at all? No, it's just the things you do as an entrepreneur. Right? <laughs> that is crazy. Okay, what about other things for the, as far as the rocket goes? Any things that were unique to New Zealand or even unique to your turbo pumps or your, you know? Oh, I mean, there's just, just oh man, there's so many. I mean, a rocket is just, an insanely complex piece of equipment. Um, so, um, yeah, what can what can I talk about? I, the trouble is here, Tim, is every day is a battle, right? Yeah. I mean, every day it's something. Yeah. So it's it's hard to say what what is what is something that really caught us by surprise. Your original rocket mm -hmm. that you built, kind of as because I've heard you say that you don't want to show up trying to sell something like through PDF. You want to be able to no, bring hardware points. around and hate PowerPoints and, and showing people that you can actually, you know, do yep. what you say you're going to do. And so I think your original intent uh, was then to do the Artia sounding rocket, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and you were the first uh, in the southern hemisphere yep. to reach space. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, so what? But what lessons did you learn in building that? I think one of them is what, what was what were we using for fuel again? Well, that was, uh, it was a hybrid, so it was nitrous oxide, and um, I built a, we, we developed our own solid fuel um, oh, okay. to go in there, yeah. yeah. And w so, was that one of those things where, I, I think I heard in an interview somewhere that you said, you kind of thought it was almost like, the con you know, almost screwing convention, like, I'm sure this is almost better. Why, why did you pursue that propellant choice, and what lessons did you learn, and how did that apply to your next vehicle then? Yeah. Um, uh, well, it didn't really. That's the that's the guts of it. You didn't learn from that. Is it well, I mean, I, I learned. I mean, you learn different things. I think. I think. You know, the the best learnings are the the things that go wrong. Mm -hmm. When when things go right, then there's a tendency to go oh good and stop. Mm -hmm. um, when things go wrong, you really understand things. You know. A lot, a lot more. Um, well, clearly, you didn't learn not to go with convention because of the three no, things that are no. radically different about this vehicle. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess, um, I, I'm, I look at everything from a very pragmatic point of view, from a basic engineering point of view, and um, you know, just because something's been done that way mm -hmm. um, for you know before, it doesn't mean it needs to also be done that way because. Right. You know, when it was done that way back in 1960, is you had these resources to pull upon. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you have a different set of resources now to pull upon. Mm -hmm. So why should you be doing it that same way? Mm -hmm. um, so you know, within Rocket Lab, we're not, we're not afraid of new stuff. Mm -hmm. 
you know, if someone comes with a new piece of software that will help, you know, even if it's just a new piece of sales software, mm -hmm. we're not like, oh, well, you know, is this kind of spreadsheet or whatever. It's it, it's open slather, right? If, if it's if it's newer and it's better, then we'll, we'll go for it. That's and I feel like that's yeah, you're, you're right. I feel like the traditional aerospace has been make it work and then mm. stop, stop. Yeah. And then if it like making a change is a huge, huge deal. Yeah. And yeah. a big bureaucratic deal even down the chain of the command in the company. Yeah. You know, if someone a technician sees a problem that goes, this isn't the most efficient way I could assemble this. Yeah. It might take them a year to yeah, yeah, yeah. have anyone actually listen. Yeah. And it seems like your approach is is quite a bit different, and people have a lot more individuality and a lot of. Yeah, and that, that's the fun thing about Rocket Lab is we're we're of a size um, where you can still have an influence. Mm -hmm. So we're not a seven thousand people or ten thousand people company where it's very difficult for someone on the shop floor to have, you know, or anywhere within the company to actually have true ownership and mm -hmm. and make a true difference. Mm -hmm. But um, I'd say we're we're at a sweet spot in size where you can come to the company and and you know actually have real responsibility mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and make, a, make a real difference. Yeah. And I think that's, that's, that's one of the unique things, uh, things about it. And you know, we, we run a flat structure here. So you know, I don't believe in offices. Um, I just sit out with everybody else and mm -hmm. um, that's where I expect everybody else, all the managers to be. So mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very open, collaborative um, space. Yeah, uh, it's so funny because it's, you have taken Again, kind of what's being called the Silicon Valley, you know, approach. Mm. As far as it's it's a very different approach to aerospace, and I'm I'm confused because you don't have any of that background. It's not like you grew up in, in San no. Francisco, you know, trying to develop apps. Yet you're running a company in a very 21st century way. I am I am sometimes explained as an American stuck in a New Zealand body. <laughs> sometimes people say that, <laughs> but it's. That's not I don't think that's necessarily an American thing, although I did quote San Francisco as the reason for that. But mm. I, I feel like your rockets and your philosophies are just so different. And it's really refreshing. No. It's got to be just ultra, so rewarding to sit here and actually physically see the fruits of all that labor. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, it's, it's in the eyes of the, the perception of the holder, right? To me, this is just normal. This is how you would do it. Mm -hmm. So I don't see anything too radical. Mm -hmm. you know, with respect, but um, if you want people to collaborate better, don't stuff them in cubicles and offices. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a cubicle mm -hmm. here. Um, mm -hmm. st sit them beside each other. Mm -hmm. um, y it's very easy to communicate when the person sits there. Right, right. That's, uh, that's awesome. Uh, I think the only other questions I really wanted to ask yep. about uh, is, first of all, we're all learning a little more information. Your first flight was probably going to be, as far as the vehicle is concerned, a perfect flight. You just had, and tell me if this isn't something that's not the public, but basically the ground tracking stations, uh, you had an issue with one of the ground tracking stations and because you lost track, you had to terminate the rocket, is that correct? That's correct. What, were, was, was, were you actually there? Were you having to make the decision of we have to blow this rocket up? No, no, absolutely not. And that's that's, you know, that's uh, done um, by the flight. So, you know, flight termination engineers. So they're, they're sitting on a separate console, isolated from everybody else, and watching the track. And when the track goes blank, there's there's no thinking involved. So was there an elapsed time though where you could see that the track had gone blank before no, you knew? No, 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 no. I mean, um, the first we knew it is the second stage engine had shut down, and we didn't know why it shut down. And then the call came that it was terminated. How did that feel? Um, it was okay. I yeah. mean, in some respects, yeah, that, that's, that's gutting. But in other respects, we went through, you know, on a first flight, let's be honest, um, you, you, you know, I said to the team that we're not putting a vehicle on the pad unless everybody in the room has a 92% probability that it's, all their systems are going to work. Mm. So I polled everybody and everybody had to give me a 92% probability that their systems are going to work. <laughs> then we'll put something on the pad. So we went into that at least thinking we had a good vehicle, but there's an awful lot that you don't know because right. you just can't test. Yeah, you can um, fly. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we got through all of the all of the high risk events, uh, yeah. right through fairing separation. We're just cruising. We had what was it, 120 seconds left to burn on the second stage. Oh. So, um, but from that flight, you know, we, we got all the data we needed yeah. to to really know what we had. 
because yeah. we had you know over 30,000 channels of instrumentation on that flight. So we, we knew everything that was going on. Wow. And um, so, you know, it's easy. I am not I don't sort of look back and I'm not a reflective guy in that sense. You know, it'd be easy to, to be all angry and, and, but the reality is I'm super happy because we got, um, we got through all those events. We measured all the things we really needed to measure. That was, that was we, tr we ran that launch just like any other test that mm -hmm. we would do, whether yeah. it be for an engine or for a structural component. Mm -hmm. It was a test. Mm -hmm. um, and the object of a test is to gather data. And we gathered all the data we needed to gather. Yeah. So from our perspective, that was very successful. Um, now, would have we loved it if we just carried on for the extra 100 seconds or so? Yeah, right. Of course. Right. But um, I think I think we all we all learned a lot, yeah. and um, from from that, and you know, it's it's uh, it, it sharpens your focus on on some of the more operational areas. Um, mm -hmm. It's not just about the rocket. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of moving parts around getting huge, that rocket huge amount on the pad and then off the ground. Yeah. So I mean, regardless, second flight being a complete success yep. is just equally huge. I mean. Mm. That's that's gonna go down in, in history. I feel like you know I, I can't think of hardly any vehicles ever that have been that successful already on their second launch. And now uh, you guys have had a, a bit of a, a reevaluation on on uh, well, what have you have to reevaluate since your uh, attempt at its business time? Yeah, yeah. So so like I guess mentioned before, we we we're, we're not we're not rushing. We're 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 working out how do we build the next 100 rockets, not rush into the next milestone. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't we, we're not scrap for, strap for funding, so we don't have to take big risks to get to the next milestone because of funding and things mm -hmm. like that. You know, we're well backed. So for us, it's 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 the long game here. Yeah. And um, we saw some behaviour on the pad we didn't like, um, and it's kind of like jumping in your car. The engine check light comes on. Are you going to go for a journey halfway across the United States? No, you're not. Okay. You, you're going to stop and assess what, what, what you saw and the weirdness you saw. Yeah. So um, we, we saw that and we're like, no, we, this is, we, we're not going to we're not going to fly with that. Mm -hmm. um, and we we you know we isolated down to a motor controller um, and then we we looked at the motor controller and we changed some processes and we thought that that would buy us the confidence we need mm -hmm. needed and then we put another one back on the pad and, and saw a very similar thing. Um, so for us, it, it wasn't. It was like, okay. Now we actually need to make a hardware change. Mm, so okay. we went in and we made a hardware change to totally eliminate um, any of these these issues from occurring again. Oh. And you have to understand these motor controllers. Um, nobody's ever built these before. Right. These are all new. Yeah. Nobody's ever dealt with this amount of power and in a space environment and all those kinds of things. So it's not like there's a book you go to <laughs> to how how to design these things. Right. Um, like so there literally is for turbo pump for a, a gas generator. Exactly. They can literally pull from a, a pool of knowledge on that. Exactly. Yeah. You guys haven't. No. And look, we could have put a put a rocket on the pad literally the following week and gone. But it's once again, it's our our, our vision and our, our our eyes are on the big the big wins here, the, mm -hmm. the hundred rockets. Mm -hmm. So you know, a few years time, no nobody will remember we scrubbed. This launch a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Everybody will remember if we had an issue on the way up. Yep. And yep. you know, it's just not our style. Like yeah. we will not go unless we're 100 percent right. Yeah. And if that means that we, we scrub a bit, I just don't care. Yeah. Call me the scrub company. I don't care. Yeah. But when I launch, I will be launching with a vehicle that that at least we we believe is 100 mm -hmm. percent And that makes sense. I mean, that's the the right thing to do. And it's so funny when I, you know, I was personally live streaming uh, the last attempt of its business time. Yeah, yeah. And the comment section, unfortunately, because it's the internet, you know, like, yeah, yeah. I, and I'm sitting there going, guys, it doesn't matter. Mm. Like, so what? You, you don't get to watch a rocket launch? Yeah, like, yeah. hey, you're not, <laughs> you don't, like, that's not something you deserve, you know, like, yeah, yeah. this is free entertainment for people to be able to, to watch. And second of all, in the long run, all that matters is mission success. It's all that matters. It's all that matters. Yeah. And that's amazing that you know you guys have already had the maturity to make those decisions and to know the long-term viability of that. Mm -hmm. And not only that, manufacturing-wise, if you were going ahead with something hardware that you weren't positive on, you would have potentially dozens of rockets manufactured with, the, with bad hardware. And so for you guys, it's probably... And exactly. And the, the sort of flight cadence that we're trying to get into um, we don't have time to go back and make hardware changes. Now's the time yeah. to go and do these yeah. things and get it right. Yeah. Um, and you know, like I say, we, we're, we're, we've got our eye on the bigger prize, which is you know we're not looking to build 
two rockets, five rockets. We're looking to build hundreds. Yeah. And taking the time now to get it right, um, it makes it infinitely more easier now than it does, you know, rocket number 300 to right. go and make a hardware change. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, I love that. Like, that's mature and very, very admirable. I think that's, that's awesome. So, I guess as far as uh, probably one of the last things I can really think to ask about mm. is we really didn't talk too much about the actual electric turbo pumps. Mm -hmm. So when you guys started with a blank slate again, yep. um, were you looking for like off the shelf components for the motors? Were you, you know, oh. what kind of helped drive that? Or, or do you build the actual motors Of course. Yourself? You can't go and buy like a 60 kilowatt motor the size of a Coke can. No, <laughs> they don't exist. You can't even, you're not even for like electric cars or anything or? No. Really? No, no way. I guess I never thought of that. I, I mean, in one, in one electron, you have the same amount of power as your average family sedan in two electric motors that are the size of Coke cans. So Wait, how, like, how many horsepower or whatever measurement you would use? Well, I mean, I mean the, the, the nominal rating is 40 kilowatts per, per motor, so that's 80 kilowatts. Holy cow. In, in one Rutherford. And you have nine of those. How many horse, like in horsepower terms then, I guess? Oh, kilowatts to horsepower, 760 watts per horsepower, so... <laughs> Sorry. I You're not going to film this bit, are you? <laughs> Pete should know this. how to convert kilowatts to <laughs> no, horsepower. Yeah, right, the fact that you can convert on the fly. I'd have to Google kilowatt hours to horsepower. And like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cause those are some of the numbers that I, I just don't think people understand the actual power these things are capable of, you know, it's... Yeah, it's around about 100, 100 to 110 horsepower. Per? Per Rutherford. Per Rutherford. Yeah, in electric motors. That is... And about, that, yeah, and that's just in the electric motors. And a lot, it, you see one when you have a look around. They're, they're, well, they're actually smaller than a Coke can. So that has to be probably the highest density of... For electric we, motor, we, don't, you know? we don't know of any others, no. We don't wow. Okay, so as far as you guys using turbo pumps, electric turbo pumps, mm. um, that had been a lot easier to actually ramp up production and or ramp up at least your, your development of the actual Yeah, well, the, the whole ethos around it was you take a horrendously complicated thermodynamic problem, which is a gas generator cycle, um, and turn it into software. Mm -hmm. So what people don't realize with the electric turbo pump is, yes, you have infinitely variable throttle control, but you're not orificing valves and you're not changing you know, mixture ratios and gas generators and combustors and whatnot. It is literally software. And the lovely thing is, is you, know, you can control your startup, you know, your lead lag, propellant rates and startup and all your shutdowns. You can control your mixture ratio. So your mixture ratio we control just with incredible accuracy mm -hmm. because you know, it's a real time control loop feedback into mixture control. So, you know, one of the nicest thing about electric turbo pumps is you can suck those tanks dry, absolutely mm. dry. Mm. So that, you know, the, the engine shuts down when we run out of propellant. Whereas a gas generator cycle, if you do that, you blow your gas generator to pieces. So for us, you know, we can just load sense on the pump and as the pump, you know, depletes the propellant, it's, you know, 100 milliseconds and the engine shut down. Huh. So, you so know. So you actually, in a sense, gain a little bit more mass fraction that way too because. Of course. You don't have to have that extra reserve of fuel. That's completely exactly. useless. Yep, completely useless. Yeah. How, what What is that? Do you know approximately? Is it like one percent of fuel or something? Oh, I mean, it, it, it ranges depending on, on on the vehicles. But I mean, you know, you, you, on the especially on the old vehicles, you'll hear out, you hear the call out, you know, propellant depletion detect, and then the engine shuts down, which is, you know, in some cases a little float switch in the tank or whatever, yeah. you know, and you still got you know a reasonable amount of. Tank and measurable amount. Yeah. Measurable, and if your mixture ratio is wrong, you can end up with quite a lot of one propellant in, in mm. one tank and a little bit in the other. And if you, you know, worst case, if you screw that up, then you know you'll disintegrate a turbo pump. Yeah. But wow. for us, we just run the thing dry. That's so. So between that and the fact that you do hot swapping batteries mm -hmm. on the upper stage, mm -hmm. is that literally? Is it a, because it is a one-to-one -one ratio for the amount of mass on an upper stage that you yep. carry to orbit? Yep, correct. To your payload p potential. So, yep. does that mean you're literally ditching potentially hundreds of kilograms like off of those upper stage batteries? No, the batteries aren't, aren't that particularly heavy. Um, okay. You know, they're very lightweight, efficient, mm -hmm. efficient batteries. Um, I guess if you were if you had a gas generator cycle, you would be carrying more propellant 
mm-hmm. mass than the battery mass mm-hmm. because of the efficiency of the cycle. Mm-hmm. But I mean, with a you, you're burning it all the time, right? You know, with a with a gas generator. But you know, we we wait for discrete points in time to eject the batteries because yeah. as as you as you get further and further and closer into orbit, the you know it's it's less sensitive when you start the burn to when you finish the burn. So there's an optimum point in time where you 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 ditch those batteries. What's more sensitive, like the the payload to mass ratio? Oh, it's right. not actually linear and static, linear right. oh, over there. Okay. So it start when the stage is full and your acceleration is relatively low. Right. Then it's not a one to one ratio. But as right. you get closer to the end of the burn, it right. becomes. But it's easy just to just just fudge it and say it's one to one. Right. But it's not actually one to one. Well, and just like the the payload, you know, the fairings because they aren't taken to. It's not the same as the first stage because they're there for a little bit longer. A little bit longer. You yeah. know, and they get ditched. It, it just has to do with that it's part of the rocket equation, essentially. It is. It is. Yeah. Um, how many times do you hot swap? Is there just two sets of two, or how many batteries are on those upper stages? Yeah, there, I mean, there's, there's three batteries on there, and we, we, we hot swap out two on the way up. Okay. That's, that's genius. That's one of those things that I think is such a cool mm. cool idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you end, like I say, you end up with. Um, Pretty much the efficiency of a gas generator, if not better. And that's for now, too. Oh, for now. Yeah. Okay, give, so I guess, give me some time. So I guess then the last question that I want to ask you, why don't you think anyone else is doing an electric generator yet? Well, I mean, it's funny because um, uh, when we first started, um, there was, a, let's just say there's a European organization that looked at it and, you know, said to me personally, he said, you know, Pete, this is the dumbest idea. What are you doing? This will never work. This is stupid. And that same European organization now has a program that's funded for millions of dollars studying it um, that, you know, now it's a good idea. So I think, I think part of it is that, you, you know, you just need to prove that it works. Yeah. And then, you know, even if it's a dumb idea until it works, yeah. then it's obvious. <laughs> so um, I think there's a little bit of that. And, um, you know, I, I would not be surprised to see other launch vehicles, and small launch vehicles especially, uh, you know, develop this, you know, use this, the electric turbo pump cycle. Yeah. And you know, they're teaching it in um, in propulsion classes now. It's really? a cycle they teach. So do you have to? Do you, do they tap into some of your knowledge? Do they ask you questions oh, about that stuff? Or? No, no. I mean, it's they've it's everyone's been able to you know it's it's not figured out. Yeah, figure it's not. Yeah, it's yeah. not. I mean, the the physics are easy. It's the engineering yeah. is always the, right. the the tricky bit. But, yeah. Um, it's kind of fundamental. It's a fundamental idea. It's yeah, not yeah, some yeah. novel. It's got its own Wikipedia page. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I had to look into that when I was yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> researching your company. Yeah, that's true. That's so cool. Is there anything else that you can think of that you're excited about? I guess then let's end on this because mm-hmm. I, I think I've heard you say it, but but what's it's I know it's not a bigger rocket, mm-hmm. but what is next? Like, what are you looking most forward to that in five, ten, twenty years? You know, will really define Rocket Lab mm-hmm. or define your career, define your work. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, so there's a couple of things here. I think I think if we're able to deliver on what we want to do here and you know achieve the launch frequency that, that, that we're promising, then the world will be a different place. I mean, we will enable to build infrastructure and all, but that will affect everybody on Earth. And that's that's what wakes me up in the morning is is knowing that we can actually have a meaningful effect to the species. Mm-hmm. That that is that is ultimately what wakes me up in the morning. But as as for Rocket Lab, um, look, I'm just getting started. This is the beginning. This is not the end. Um, there's there's a lot that we need to do yet. Um, mm-hmm. So watch the space. There's a lot more coming. That's awesome. That's the best way you could possibly end an interview, I think. Cool. Oh, Peter, thank you so much. My pleasure. Really, this place is amazing, and I, uh, I'm already very inspired. So I know I'm not going to be alone on that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, great work. Thank you so much, Rocket Lab, for inviting me out to see your gorgeous new factory. And thank you, Peter Beck, for your time and hospitality. It was a real pleasure chatting with you. I owe a huge thanks to my Patreon supporters for helping me be able to do trips like this across the world and allow me to share my amazing experiences. If you want to help me continue producing content like this, head on over to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. And while you're on the internet, check out my web store for some awesome space merch. EverydayAstronaut.com slash shop. Thanks, everybody. That does it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.